I talked to the guy who, you know, like this is a worldwide endeavor, but he was probably the single most responsible individual for all the significant developments in the supply chain in the last 30 years. And he said to me, he said, Jim, you have to understand, it took us 30 years to build it. We blew it up in three years. It's not going to come back overnight. Mm -hmm. It's going to take 10 years or more to rebuild it. And what I talk about in the book is supply chain 1.0, which is 1989 to 2019. And then supply chain 2.0, which kind of starts now, but it's going to go indefinitely because it's going to take a long time to put this together. It's, uh, you know, it's like dropping a vase and it breaks in a, th a thousand pieces. You can't put it back together. You got to go buy a new vase. And that's what's going on with the supply chain. The, there will be a supply chain. There always is. But the new supply chain will look very different from what we've just come through. Because the whole the whole 30 years of period I'm describing was built on efficiency. You know, lower cost, lower cost, lower cost. It was kind of the Walmart model. So you had just-in-time inventory. Everyone knows about that. But there's something called cross-stocking. That's where a truck pulls up at a warehouse and you unload it. Instead of putting the stuff in the warehouse, you move it to another truck that then goes to a destination. The stuff never goes in the warehouse. Inventories are very expensive. They're they're they're, they're costly to finance. You got to move the stuff around. It's called picking. You know, pick the stuff off the shelf with your. I used to drive a forklift, so I know a little bit about it. Uh, you know, and put it on a truck. You unload trucks too. Um, but um, so so, you know, hey, I've got seven suppliers. Why don't I cut it down to three and do bigger contracts with each one and get lower unit costs? I've got five transportation lanes. Why don't I cut that down to two, get everything to you know Los Angeles and Seattle as the case may be, you know, et cetera. And they, they did it for three and they got costs lower, you know, and, and Walmart and Amazon were the champions of this, but everyone else was doing it. But they missed something. What they missed was that they while they were getting those unit unit costs lower for consumers, they there were hidden costs. And the main hidden cost was you, you were creating greater frailty. This whole system was subject to a massive, massive breakdown. So uh, you know, what happens if you have two suppliers and they both go on strike? What happens if you have one port of entry and it's backlogged? What happens if um, uh, you, you know you, you you've got uh, cross docking in warehouses and there aren't enough trucks? There's a eighty there are eighty thousand we need 80,000 drivers, 80,000 drivers. I wish they'd hire them instead of these IRS agents. But the point being, um, it, it is breaking down all across the board. Now, will it, it can it be put back together? Yes, but the biggest difference between 2.0 and 1.0, um, this goes by different names. Uh, you know, Johnny Yellen called it friendshoring and Macron called it a constellation of nations. Uh, I, I use the term a college of nations, you know, collegial, club, if you will. So you'll still have trading partners, you'll still have outsourcing, you'll still have transportation lanes, but it'll be members only. It'll be basically democratic, kind of liberal republics, Western Europe, uh, you know, the EU, of course, uh, US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, uh, you know, and, and some others, India, we expect to be included, Fri friendly nations, but China's out. We're decoupling from them. They're decoupling from us. This isn't US driven, the US is participating. But this is what China wants too. Both sides are decoupling as fast as they can. China can develop its own network, you know, maybe Central Asian Republic, some Southeast Asian, um, you know, suppliers and so forth. But they're going to lose customers. Well, most of their customers actually, in in the United States, we won't buy their stuff, <clears throat> and we won't sell them our stuff, particularly high tech stuff. So, you, the world's going to break. And, and these new clubs are going to be formed and there will be trade and there will be transportation lanes, but it'll be much more restrictive. Now, will prices be a little higher? Yes, but it'll be more secure. So the way I describe that, you know, if you buy uh, insurance on your house or I buy insurance on my house, you don't want your house to burn down. You hope it doesn't. But if it does, you don't think your insurance premiums are a waste of money. Like when you write that check, you're like, that's money well spent. When you pay higher prices for consumer goods, the, the delta between the old price and the new price is your insurance premium for a more reliable system. And also, there's a big national security component to this. And I talk about Russia and Ukraine and China in the book. So that's all. Uh, so so the, uh, the, the, how the supply, you know, what the supply chain breakdown means, chapter one, chapter two, what caused it, and we talked to, about that, and three, where is it going? 
Uh, what are the constraints? And we talked about that. But then my editor, who's love working with us, she said, well, Jim, got to be a chapter, a chapter on inflation. I said, of course we do. You know, the supply chain breakdown is causing a lot of the inflation we see. And we agreed on that. And then I said, I'm, and I'm going to write another chapter on deflation. And everyone's like, wait a second, why are you talking about deflation? That's coming next. People are not ready for it. I know the inflation's here. I buy gasoline. I, I shop in the grocery store. I get it. I'm not, it it's, and it's persistent. It's not transitory. I understand all that. But inflation has two major sources. One is the supply side, which is called cost push inflation. So that's energy price shocks, you know, the stuff we're seeing coming out of Ukraine, fertilizer shortages, strategic metal shortages, um, uh, you know, component suppliers who can't deliver stuff to factories in Germany and they're shutting down, et cetera. The other cause is from the demand side, and that's called demand pull inflation, basically psychological. Consumers pull demand forward. They're like, hey, I was thinking of buying a refrigerator. I better buy it today because the price is going to go up in six months. And in the 70s, we had both. It started with cost push with the Arab oil embargo, but it ended up demand pull. Um, I was starting my career at the time. They, Your boss would just give you a raise. You didn't even have to ask. You know, inflation was going up so fast. Like, I better give this guy a raise. He gives another, you know, 30,000 bucks or whatever because people would quit, you know. And, uh, and, that, and that sort of spun out of control until Volcker squashed it all. Right now, we do not have... Uh, demand pull inflation. We don't. This, this is not what's going on. We do have cost push inflation. The difference is, is hugely important because cost push inflation <clears throat> from the supply side, which is again, when I talk about in the book, it's real, prices go up, but uh, it's self negating. You know, the old saying that, you know, the cure for higher oil prices is higher oil prices because when they get too high, people stop driving. They, they, they shut down um, <clears throat> various activities. By the way, if you're unemployed, you're not buying any gasoline because you're not going anywhere. I mean, that's, that's kind of a nasty way of putting it, but that's that's how the cost push inflation, <clears throat> pardon me, tips into a recession and then prices come down. And we saw that in 1974, you know, you had Jerry Ford and Alan Greenspan walking around with their, they had these wind buttons, you know, WIN, was so for whip inflation now, except we had a recession and prices collapsed. Uh, now it came back uh, by 77 with, uh, for, for a lot of reasons. But but right now, we don't have demand pull. We have cost push. It will go away when this economy goes into recession. And then we're going to be talking about um, disinflation and deflation, which are, you know, kind of close cousins. And the Fed's going to be out on a limb as usual, raising rates in the face of a, a recession and a price collapse. Ah, and Jim, that's such a great point. It's one I've actually been engaged in conversation with on, on the recent past videos we've had on this channel, which is, um, uh, I'll go back to, to conversation I had with Lacey Hunt last, where Lacey Hunt's been a big deflationist for a long time, as you know well. In my last conversation with him at, at Wealthion's uh, recent um, it's, uh, September conference, um, Lacey basically said, hey, look, Fed's doing what it has to do. It's got to actually prioritize killing inflation now that inflation's here. Um, and, uh, you know, talked about the, the the primacy of that being priority number one, two, and three right now for the Fed. Um, and then I asked him, I said, well, Lacey, you know, I've been talking to you for years, and you've been telling us that we have this massive deflationary dragon to slay, and you don't really see how we're going to do that well, and that's why you're raising these warning bells. It's a big, big issue. But you're now saying there's this inflation dragon that's shown up, and so we got to focus all our attention on killing it. Hopefully we will. Sounds like you're pretty sanguine in the in the, the sense that like, hey, recession and other factors are probably going to bring inflation down organically here at some point. But even if we manage to do that successfully, we then still have this massive big inflation dragon to deal with. <laughs> and it sounds like you're saying, hey, well, even though we're all focused on inflation right now, the bigger bad in the story is the deflation one. 